In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so last week we did some question and answer. We kind of went through a general overview of the rest of this sort of period of sinfulness. And, um, and so I went back through the audiences, and I, there's a couple of themes that I want to highlight before going on to redemption. And, okay, come on. And my slides are not cooperating. Okay, so we've already been talking about how we're created in God's image and how original sin corrupts God's image in us, right? That creation in the image of God meant that we were called to be his sons and daughters, that we were called into that state of original solitude, and then called to manifest God's image in the relationship between men and women. But that original sin has corrupted all of that. It resulted in a disintegrity of our body and soul. But that Christ has come to restore us to this ethos of redemption, or to redempted life, a resurrected life. And that's where we're going to kind of head today. In some of his later audiences, in that section on historical sinfulness, John Paul II breaks down that verse in Matthew chapter 5. And he breaks it down into three parts. He says, the first part is, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. And that points to like the objective law that you cannot join yourself to a person who is not your lawful husband or wife. Then he talks about looking at a woman to desire her, just sort of part two. And then the third part where he says, this person has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the general elements are to commit adultery, to desire to commit adultery in the body, and to commit adultery in the heart. Come on, slides. So what is Christ intending to do? He's intending to build a new ethos. Okay, Remember, our ethos is sort of our way of understanding morality. Okay, It's our way of understanding human sexuality, and it's our way of looking at the world. The road to this new ethos passes through the rediscovery of the values that had been lost in the general understanding of the Old Testament and in the application of this commandment, you shall not commit adultery. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to help us to rediscover those values that had been lost by original sin. So that's why we spent all of those first couple of weeks on what it means to be created in the image of God, who we are in relationship to God, the spousal meaning of the body, that original nakedness that means you can know everything about me and it's okay. Our original need for affirmation, that original need to be loved and to love one another as Christ has loved us. So by rediscovering that, then we can come to understand what our Lord is calling us to. Because he's not simply calling us to conform ourselves to this law or to these rules, but rather he's calling us to love as we're meant to love. So the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, has to do with justice. It has to do with the, what I owe to my spouse. Right? Justice is the virtue by which we give other people their due. It's the virtue by which we give other people their due. When two people join themselves to each other in matrimony, their due is, I owe you everything that I am. That husband who gives himself to his wife, he expects that she's going to give him everything that she is. And so that positive form of justice is about giving the other person their due. 
The prohibition against adultery in the heart is the key to understanding its correct ethical meaning. It's the main source for revealing the essential values of this new ethos. So it's not just about whether physically I conform to what we've agreed to in marriage, but rather it's about whether or not I'm giving you my heart, that I'm giving you everything that I am. In audiences 42 and 43, John Paul II talks about a first and second reading of the text. He says, Adultery in the heart is not committed only because the man looks in this way at a woman who is not his wife, but precisely because he looks in this way at a woman at all. So as he went through that treatment of justice, And it says, you know, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. And then he goes through all those sort of questions that high school kids like to ask. You know, well, what if he's not married? Can he do it anyway? Can then can he do it? Because he's not committing adultery against his wife. Or what if he's not married, but she's married? What if neither of them are married? Is it okay then? And the answer is, it's wrong because, precisely because he looks in that way at a woman, period. It's not only about the violation of a relationship, it's about the violation of who we are created to be in the image of God. He says, when this look of lust happens, the person, in this case the woman, becomes for the other person, the man, above all an object for the possible satisfaction of his own sexual urge. She becomes... Just an object, not somebody that he admires, that he wants to lay his life down for, that he wants to give himself to, but rather just somebody that can satisfy his own sexual urge. And then he says, in this way, a deformation takes place in the reciprocal four, which loses its character as a communion of persons in favor of the utilitarian function. Right? When we talked about original man, we talked about how that original unity was a reciprocal for a being for the other person, right? There's a article that Bishop Vigneron, Archbishop Vigneron gave me when I was a seminarian. I went through this phase when I was in first theology where I thought about switching dioceses back to Michigan. And, um, and so I went on this sort of visitation, the Sacred Heart Seminary. Uh, Archbishop Vigneron was then the rector. And, So he gave me this article that he wrote on chastity, and one of the lines that he quoted in there that really struck me was, you know, God just didn't create us to be, he created us to be for. You know, like we're not called as human persons just to sort of hang out as individuals, but rather all of us have this mission of being for somebody else, of living our lives for somebody else. And that's where this idea of the gift comes in that we're all created to be a gift for another person. I would go a step further and say we can only be a gift for someone else when we realize the gift that God has been for us first. We have to receive that gift in order to give it to somebody else. It goes back to those questions I always like to ask people, like what is more important, to love or to be loved? And everybody wants to say to love because that's the gift. But can you give what you don't have? No. No. So what's more fundamental? To be loved. And that reciprocal for between the man and the woman, it always is rooted in the fact that God is first for them. Right? God wants the good for them. They entrust themselves to God. They have the secure base from which they can make a gift of love to each other. But that look of lust deforms that reciprocal for because then the other person becomes an object for me and a satisfaction for my sexual urge. So the commandment that Jesus calls us to, right, you shall not commit adultery, it's fulfilled by purity of heart. Right? That commandment finds its right motive in the indissolubility of marriage in which man and woman unite with each other in virtue of the original plan of God, so that the two become one flesh. Right? We fulfill that sixth commandment law 
by living out that life of love that Jesus called us back to in Matthew chapter 19. And so the new ethos is found in the liberation of the heart from concupiscence so that man can shine more fully in his heart, male and female, and all the inner truth of the reciprocal four. That new way of looking at sex and sexuality, that new way of looking at love, that new way of looking at relationships, right? it all is ordered towards this liberation from concupiscence or liberation from the effects of sin so that we can be more fully human. And so John Paul II said that man must rediscover the lost fullness of his humanity and want to regain it. Right? That's what we came for. That's what we came to hear. I want to hear about what I lost so that I build a desire to regain that. You know, so many people that, when, as I've gone around and given talks on theology of the body or on parenting or my internet talk that I give, what they hear in the talk is, there's something that I lost and I really want to find that. You know, and then they come and they want to do spiritual reduction or they want to learn more or they came to this class. You know, that's what we want to inspire in the hearts of our young people, you know, to help them to realize that there's something that was there that was lost and want to give them the desire to regain it. You know, I had the most amazing afternoon today. And I tried to tell the story without revealing any identities. <laughs> but I have a young guy that comes to see me, and uh, admittedly, he comes because his grandma makes him. Um, and so I remember the first time he showed up on my calendar and it just said, like, this kid's coming to see you. His grandma's making him come. <laughs> and so he comes in and he sits down. And he's got his baseball hat all pulled down and he just sits there giving me the stare. And so I, I just talk to him like, so your grandma made you come. Tell me how you feel about that. And we just started this conversation and, um, and really, we don't talk about anything other than, you know, every once in a while I try to throw in, do you know how much Jesus loves you? And, and we just kind of kept talking like that. So today, I had an appointment with him, and it's probably six months later. He shows up with two of his buddies. There's like three, three of these high school kids sitting there with grandma. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? And, uh, and so they come into my office and, uh, and so this, this kid, he was like, hey, Father, how's it going? These are my friends. Just want you to know I went to Mass the last couple of weeks, and then, you know, I got back to confession last week, and, uh, and I was talking to these guys, and they want to talk to you. Okay? And then he looks at his friends, and he's like, okay, talk. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to him about anything. Just talk to him. And, uh, and so I ended up giving them this whole, like, God created the world and everything was good, blah, 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 blah. all the Trinity stuff. And they really liked it, I think, you know, and, and, uh, and then they left. And I was like, how beautiful is that? Like somewhere this first person realized that he lost something and he wants to regain it. And then he wanted to go tell his friends about it. They were probably like, doing chores or something or they all got in trouble. I don't know. And he was like, oh, I talked to this priest. Really? You talked to a priest? What's his deal? And so they all came in, and um, I don't know if they'll all come back, but it was really, I don't know, it just brought me a lot of joy, um, and it gave me a lot of hope, because sometimes we might think, you know, like young people don't really care, and it's impossible to preach the gospel to them, and, but lo and behold, like this happened. And these are not kids who are like, you know, they're not going to be a leader on the next tech retreat. But they might be one on the next, you know, next years. Who knows? I don't know what'll happen. Um, but I don't know. I just wanted to share that because it gave me a lot of joy today, and it also <laughs> illustrates this point, you know, about rediscovering that lost fullness of our humanity and having the desire to find it again. So all of that lent to that line that I had in the slides last week about how it's possible even for a man to commit adultery in, heart, in his heart with his own wife. 
right? Because it's precisely because of the look where the sin lies as it reveals his heart. And this is an aspect of theology of the body when we're trying to get to the fullness that is really important for us to constantly focus on is to really purify everything about our relationships. So is all of this to accuse our heart of being bad or is our heart called to the good? You know, Manichaeism, again, is that philosophy that says material things are bad and the spirit is good. So Manichaeism, it seems to be consistent with Christ's words when he says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Or if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Right? Manichaeism condemns the body. And sometimes we can do that too. We can sort of take those words of Christ and we can start to condemn the body. People who struggle with sin in their life, they tend to condemn their body and think to themselves, my body's so bad. But on the other hand, we might see these words rather as a condemnation of the human heart, not the body. There's something wrong with my heart. There's something wrong in the way I understand myself as created in the image of God. There's something wrong with the way that I understand God's love for me. So whenever we're talking about purity, it's, we have to can include this dimension of the human heart. Because remember, the body is called to be a manifestation of the spirit. The body is the sacrament of the person. And so our body reveals who we are. Last week we talked about how the look reveals my intentionality. It reveals who I am. And so the things I look at reveal who I am. And what our Lord calls us to is a life where that look actually reveals where we are. And sometimes our intention in our head is, I love the Lord and I want to give my life to Him and I surrender my life to Him. But then our heart isn't all the way converted. And so I can say in my head, I've given myself to Jesus, but if my heart's not converted, I still find myself looking over here or over there. You know, that complete conversion of the Spirit would mean that I want to look at our Lord. Today in my homily, I was talking about how our Lenten sacrifices really are about where we look. And we can kind of white-knuckle through our Lenten sacrifice. And we were like, oh, I want to eat those cookies. And we just find ourselves staring at those cookies. And we're like, how many hours till Sunday? So I can cheat. It's legit to not do your sacrifice on Sunday. But the look toward the cookies reveals where my heart is. And so removing them from my life is for the sake of looking at our Lord. You know, it's for the sake of looking towards our Lord. So every time I want to eat cookies, I look towards our Lord. Or every time I want to look at Facebook, I look towards our Lord. You know, it goes back to, if I look towards our Lord every time I check my email on my phone, I would be a saint. And I think a lot of us would be a saint. And so it's about like manifesting that like inner desire and bringing that desire into our hearts. Manichaeism leads to a condemnation of the body and sex. And we start to think sex is bad or the body is bad. Sex is something we have to put up with. Instead of seeing it as the fullness of the communion of persons. So, Christian ethos is characterized by a transformation of the human person's consciousness and attitudes, such as to express and realize the value of the body and of sex. Right? Our hearts are called to be transformed, our consciousness is called to be transformed. So that transformation leads us into a more complete realization of our call to be sons and daughters of God, to be an image of Christ's love for the church. 
And then John Paul II goes into these masters of suspicion because it's not only Manichaeism which forms this threat, but there's also these masters of suspicion, he calls them. And these masters of suspicion are famous characters that have formed our hearts, our minds. They form the media. And uh, they've had a bigger influence on our culture than we have sometimes. So Freud is the first one. right? And so Freud is always about, everything's about sex. Everything's about drives. I need to satisfy my drives. And he corresponds to the concupiscence of the flesh when we talked about that threefold concupiscence. The second one is Marx. He corresponds to the concupiscence of the eyes. Because Marx's philosophy, it really has to do with utilitarianism and functionalism. If you change the system, you can change the culture. And then Nietzsche corresponds in some way to the pride of life. Right? Nietzsche's philosophy is like, God is dead, and I have to become God. I have to become the Superman. Right? I had a philosophy teacher at, in Rome, and he had this slide that says, Nietzsche says God is dead. And then he showed Nietzsche's like, tombstone, and it says, God says Nietzsche's dead. <laughs> so, which is really kind of funny. So these three thinkers have this big influence on our society as we know. Right? We can think that we have to do everything on our own. Sometimes we think if we just change the system, then we're going to change hearts. A lot of people blame sort of their sexual misconduct on their drives, and they're like, well, I can't help this. It's all my body's fault. And it detracts from the fact that we're created in the image of God who is love. Right? And so now as we march it forward... I want to pause for a minute because sometimes when we, dis- when we do theology of the body, we learn all these things and we're like, this is amazing. And we start to talk about how you know, our bodies are holy and sex and sexuality is holy. And sometimes we can actually make a new distortion out of that. <clears throat> like We can start to want to make every single moment this image of Christ's love for the church in a marriage. And, uh, and so I always like to go back to C.S. Lewis and his reflections. Because C.S. Lewis, in his section in The Four Loves on Eros, he has this really kind of funny thing that he says. Um, Lewis, dis- he makes this distinction between Eros and Venus. And Eros is always about sort of reaching for and ascending towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. So for Plato, Eros is this inner power that drives us towards what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. It's ascending love is the way that Pope Benedict talks about it. He calls it this ascending love that makes us rise. And so we use it also for sexual attraction because really sexual attraction is about this drive towards what is true, what is good, what is beautiful when it's in its purified state. But Lewis makes a distinction between Eros and Venus. And he talks about how sometimes, like with everything that is good, it can become a demon. Like we can look to the thing that is so good and then we turn like the sacrament into the thing and it can become a demon. So he just talks a little bit about Um, I'm going to just quote him. One author tells us that Venus, sexual love between a man and a woman, should recur through the married life in a solemn sacramental rhythm. A young man to whom I proposed, to whom I had described as pornographic, a novel that he much admired, replied with genuine bewilderment, pornographic, but how can that be? It treats the whole thing so seriously, as if a long face were a sort of mortal disin- moral disinfectant. Our friend, who harbored dark gods, the pillar of blood, school, attempt seriously to restore something like the phallic religion. Our advertisements, at their sexiest, paint the whole business in terms of the rap, the intense, the swoony, devout, seldom a hint of gaiety. 
And the psychologists have so bedeviled us with the infinite importance of complete sexual adjustment and the all but impossibility of achieving it that I could believe some young couples now go to it with the complete works of Freud, Kraft, Ebbing, Havoc, Havelock, Ellis, and Dr. Stoops spread out on the bed tables all around them. Right? It's kind of funny. Okay, so he's sort of describing like people trying to find sexual adjustment and they have all these books all over the place. Right? Sometimes young Catholic couples, like, they go and they have like an incense thing and they're sprinkling the bed with holy water and they're praying to the Trinity and asking to like be an image of Christ's love for the church. And like this happens. It does. I know you don't believe it, but it happens. So um, so Lewis's point is that sometimes Marital love is just funny. <laughs> he says, we must not be totally serious about Venus. Indeed, we can't be totally serious without doing violence to our humanity. It is not for nothing that every language and literature in the world is full of jokes about sex. Many of them may be dull or disgusting, and nearly all of them are old. But we must insist that they embody an attitude to Venus, which in the long run endangers the Christian life far less than a reverential gravity. We must not attempt to find an absolute in the flesh. Banish play and laughter from the bed of love, and you may let in a false goddess. She will be even falser than the Aphrodite of the Greeks. For they, even while they worshipped her, knew that she was laughter-loving. The mass of the people are perfectly right in their conviction that Venus is a partly comic spirit. We are under no obligation at all to sing all our love duets in the throbbing, world-without-end, heartbreaking manner of Tristan and Isolde. Let us often sing like Papa Geno and Papa Jonah instead. So he's sort of, and then he goes on and he says, like, sometimes people fart and, like, it's really <laughs> funny things happen. All right? So I just, I recommend that, like, if you want, like, something to balance out. Like, this is so amazing and holy. Just look at C.S. Lewis. Um, there's another section in, uh, I'm going to get to this because I'm pretty sure I have a slide on it. Okay. It's in the four loves. Yep. So he goes through friendship, philia, family love, um, eros, and charity. Perfect charity, the love of God. Christ calls us to an ethos of redemption. Right? Which is moving from that sort of like, I need to control myself and turn away and not look with lust to a genuine love. Or we move from eros to ethos. Right? We move from eros to ethos. So the eros doesn't simply mean like this sexual love, but we move into that ethos of redemption where we see the other person as the image of God and everything flows out of that love and the image of God. On page 316, John Paul II describes the eros of for Plato, which I already talked about. It's that ascending love. It's this drive towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. So when we talk about erotic phenomena, they are those mutual actions and ways of behaving through which man and woman approach each other and unite so as to be one flesh. Right? In and of itself, erotic phenomena is not sinful. It's good because it is an attraction towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. But it can be experienced as lust. You know, in the fall, in the result of concupiscence, we can experience that attraction as an attraction towards something that I want to be for myself or for my own good. But the eros of the original unity of man and woman was always a movement towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. A movement towards this other person who's created in the image of God. And so our goal as integrated human beings is for eros and ethos to meet in the human heart. And when they do, they bear fruit in purity. You know, that's when we have purity of heart. Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Which reveals to us that we shall see God in each other. That I'll see this other person as a person created in the image of God. That I encounter the love of God in my love of this person. Uh, 
On page 318 in audience 47, John Paul II says, If we suppose that Eros signifies the inner power that attracts man to the true, the good, and the beautiful, then we also see a road opening up within the sphere of this concept towards what Christ wanted to express in the Sermon on the Mount. While the words of Matthew 5, 27 to 28 are an accusation of the human heart, they're at the same time and even more so an appeal addressed to it. This appeal is the category proper to the ethos of redemption. Right? When Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in the heart, he's appealing to the heart, to that conversion, and the possibility and necessity of transforming what has been weighed down by concupiscence. No, that's what we're called to. We're called to transformation. Right? Not to condemn the body, but to be transformed so that our body is truly a sacrament of the person. So the erotic and the ethical don't differ from each other. They're called to meet in the human heart. And our eros must be redeemed, transformed, and sanctified, but never snuffed out. So in Deus Caritas Est, Benedict XVI, and that's his document on love, he talks about how eros can be transformed into agape. And even when we understand Eros as this sort of self-seeking love. And so when Pope Benedict talks about that, it's the idea that I see this person and I see them for the value of their body and I just want that for me. But then I start to spend time with them. In spending time with them, I start to see who they are as a person. I actually start to want the good for them. I discover that they're much more interesting in themselves than I had imagined they were in my head. And eventually, I would lay down my life for them. And so within that relationship, Eros can be transformed into agape. And that's what we're all called to. That's kind of our own experience of falling in love. That falling in love can start off on a plane that's sort of you know, maybe mundane, but it can be transformed into something great. And so when we're teaching young people, it's important to paint them the picture of the ideal route. Right? The ideal route, which is, like, you know yourself as a son and daughter of God. You're secure in yourself as a son and daughter of God. You don't need to date. You know, we want you to go on group dates, go to prom with your cousin, and we, it's safe. <laughs> Just kidding. Kind of. And to try to give them this path which is going to lead to the greatest happiness. But when we're talking to adults sometimes, I know this comes up in marriage prep, and sometimes we might say to couples in marriage preparation, well, you're not doing it the ideal way, so you're obviously going to have problems in your marriage. And I'm not sure that that's always the best practice when we're talking to adults in marriage preparation. Because common experience is, like, my good friend, Dave, who fell in love with this girl in a nightclub and then didn't do everything right, but is one of the best self-sacrificing dads that I know. He has this awesome Facebook post where they went camping, and he's describing the whole thing, like, Got all the little girls in the van, went to camping. Trees fell down. They had to get out of the van and clear the trees and get to the campsite, set up the tent. It's like 3 in the morning by the time everybody gets down to sleep. And one of the little girls got sick. So she started like, you know that movie, Stand By Me? So it started the chain reaction of puking in the tent (laughs) of the little girls. And then he had to like clean it all up, put the girls back in the van, drive back home. And he narrates all of this on his Facebook. And at the end of the post, he wrote something like, great day to be a dad. You know, and I was like, that is awesome. You know, like that is, 
that's love. Like that is self-sacrificing love. And it's, I think, evidence of like this eros that gets transformed into agape. So we always start where people are at and try to move them to transform into that love that is good. <clears throat> but to say you're automatically going to have a horrible life because you didn't do everything right so far, that's not the gospel. And Jesus doesn't say to the woman caught in adultery, okay, you messed it up. I'll try to get him not to kill you, but you're pretty much done. It's not what he says. Did no one condemn you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Make sure you don't look, miss the look of love. And make sure you don't miss the look of love. It's my favorite homily from the seminary. It's Father Sean Mahoney, who is one of our teachers, and he gave this whole sen- this homily on the woman caught in adultery, and he talks about how Jesus goes down and he writes in the sand and all the different theories about why did Jesus, like did he write the sins of the Pharisees in the sand? Was he just biding time? Did he not really know what to say, so he started writing in the sand? <laughs> and he pointed out that this woman who's caught in adultery, she's marched into this big crowd. Everybody is looking at her and judging her. They're all picking up their stones. And so where is she looking? At the ground. Because she's ashamed. So how is Jesus going to try to make sure that she can see the look of love in his own eyes? He goes down and writes in the sand. Like, let me wave my hand in front of your eyes right now. Get your attention. So that she'd look and see him writing in the sand, follow his arm up to his eyes, and not miss the look of love. And it's when she encounters the look of love that her heart is changed and it changes the way she understands herself. And it's then that she's able to go and sin no more. You know, when people have made mistakes in their life, we have to make sure they don't miss the look of love. Because the shame that results from the mistakes we make in our life keeps us from seeing the look of love because we go around looking at the ground. And when we see the look of love, it's then that that eros can be redeemed, transformed, sanctified. But it doesn't get snuffed out. We don't sort of try to smash it down or ignore it. Because our attraction to what is true, good, and beautiful is good. It's the way that God created us. And through that purification of heart, the erotic becomes the true, the good, and the beautiful. The Song of Songs has a line that says, like a guardian who watches over a hidden spring. And John Paul II says, like a guardian that watches over a hidden spring, we're called to discern the deep impulses of our hearts. We're called to watch our hearts and understand what's going on in our hearts when we are attracted. And so our goal is to draw forth from that spring of our heart what is fitting for the dignity of the gift and the communion of persons. It doesn't stifle eros, but it affords a mature spontaneity and noble gratification. Right? A mature spontaneity. That when I feel myself attracted to somebody... I'm able to discern what does that mean. And when it's ordered towards a good end, then I know that I can follow it. You know, and this treatment of the emotions, like this is also something that we need to teach our young people. We need to learn it ourselves first, but we need to teach it to our young people. Like what are our emotions telling us? Because sometimes we say things like, emotions are bad, use your reason. Emotions are unreliable, use your reason. Well, our emotions can be unreliable and we should not enter into emotivism. Emotivism is when I follow my emotion no matter what my emotion is telling me. Right? That's not good. But our emotions tell us things that are important. And so when 
we have an emotion about something, we have to ask ourselves, like, what is this emotion telling me? Like, we could use the example of coworkers who, like, end up at the water cooler every day and they just realize, hey, I really like being around this person and my heart is kind of moving right now and there's something stirring in me when I'm around them. What is that emotion telling me? Now, emotivism might be like, oh, wait, maybe I married the wrong person and this person's actually the one I was supposed to marry. Oh, my gosh, I'm in a crisis of faith. But that that explanation is not in conformity with where I want to go with my life because I've already made a promise to be faithful to someone else. And so what other explanation could there be for this emotion? Another explanation might be I haven't been connecting with my family enough and now there's something stirring in me and this emotion is telling me I need to go home and spend more time with my wife or we need to go on a date night. This emotion might be telling me this other person is dangerous because sometimes we can pick up on feelings that other people have. You know, like Empathy is when we have the ability to understand other people's feelings. So when we have empathy... Somebody's sad, and we feel sad. Somebody's afraid, and we feel afraid. But the same thing can happen when somebody's sort of like putting out a vibe, like a sexual vibe. Like, we could start feeling a sexual vibe. And that would be telling me, I need to stay away from this person. And like, we all, like, our hearts get moved all of the time. But our reason's job is to interpret our emotions and then order them towards the goal that we're pointed towards towards the end of our life. And it's, we should go through all these possibilities for these emotions. You know, like, I am a celibate man, and I have to follow the same rules that a married guy has to follow. So a friend of mine just pointed this out to me. I got like a rogue Facebook message from an ex-girlfriend. And I was like, well, I'm thinking about just writing her back and seeing how she's doing. And he just looked at me and he goes, okay, man. If I had the same story, what would you say to me? And I said, yeah, I'd tell you to not, not acknowledge that message. Okay. Got any other questions? <laughs> no, we all have that. We all have emotions that can affect us. Right? So like a guardian who watches over a hidden spring, we're called to discern the deep impulses of our hearts. We're called to discern, like, what is this telling me? Or where is this leading me? So eroticism is like eros that burns and consumes me. So when we fall into that sin of eroticism, it's like that fixation on this other person or a fixation on sexual sin, and it consumes me, and it can never be enough. But having a redeemed eros is more like the burning bush on Mount Sinai. It burns, but it doesn't consume. Right? It burns, but it doesn't consume. It's like that love that continues to grow within a marriage. And we are going to take a break. So, all right. So Christ's words, again, are they condemning or liberating? When he says, he who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in her heart, they're always spoken in redemption, in the perspective of the redemption of the body, in the perspective of the whole gospel, the whole teaching, and the whole mission of Christ. Right, so what he's calling us to is this transformation. They liberate us. Mary Healy, in her book, Men and Women Are From Eden, has this great example she uses of a quadriplegic. And so, <laughs> if Jesus goes up to a quadriplegic, And he says, walk. What happens? He gets up and walks. So when Jesus calls us to purity of heart, his call to purity of heart enables us to do it. Right? Like he never calls us to something we're not capable of. And so when he gives these exhortations, like in the beginning it was not so, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart, but in the beginning it was not so. He calls us to a life that we're able to live in love as he calls us to. So when he calls us to purity, he enables us to be pure. 
Right? He doesn't ask us to do things that are impossible. Right? It's grace that allows all of this to happen in our life. And remember that grace, all grace flows from the cross. Right? So we have that dynamism of Christ's love for the church, which renews everything that was lost because of sin. And the cross is the evidence that Jesus wants the good for us, that God wants the good for us. When we look at the crucifix, we're reminded, God wants the good for me. Because what does the crucifix say? It says, no matter what I've done in my life, Jesus knows all of my sins, and he still offered his life for me on the cross. He didn't sort of go to the cross and say, as long as you don't do one more boneheaded thing, I'm here for you. And he went to the cross with full knowledge of everything that we would ever do in our lives. And again, if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but he, the cross is the place where he took on himself the consequence of our sin. He didn't know sin himself, but he became sin, St. Paul says. He took on himself the consequence of sin which means he also took on himself the consequence of every sin that was ever committed against me. Every sin that was ever committed against you. So the consequence of being betrayed is I feel alone. Like I can't trust anybody. Lost. Like I'm less of a person. Jesus felt all of those things because they're the consequence of sin. When somebody is abused and they feel violated, insecure, nobody can possibly love me, I'm a horrible person, it's all my fault. Jesus felt all of those things because it's a consequence of sin. Which means he knows you more than anybody knows you. And he can love you more than anybody loves you. And knowing all of that, he took that consequence of that sin to the cross And then he descended into hell and rose again glorified. And that's what he calls us to do in the life of grace. Is that all of that can be healed in us and we can be glorified. Right before I came back from Rome, I went to the Holy Land. And I got to spend the night in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Which is an amazing place. It's a big church and when you go inside the church... There's the anointing stone where his body was anointed when it was taken down from the cross. And then you turn right and you go up these stairs and you're on the top of Calvary. And then you go down the stairs and you kind of go about 400 feet down and around the corner and there's the tomb where the resurrection happened. And so when you get locked in the Holy Sepulchre at night, you have to deal with like all of the other churches that have custody of the Holy Sepulchre. So there's the Catholics, there's the Greeks, there's the Armenians... (laughs) And they all have their liturgies and stuff. So we got to hang out in the tomb for a while. And then they kicked us out of the tomb. The Greeks come and they're like, get out, get out, Greek mess, get out. No Catholic, Greek. (laughs) It's a very charitable environment. And so we get kicked out of the tomb. And so I just went up and hung out on Calvary. And then I spent the night going back and forth from Calvary to the tomb and Calvary to the tomb and Calvary to the tomb. And it was sort of, I don't know, like the way it moved me was I would be up at Calvary and just feel like cold and this distance from our Lord and all of my sins that Jesus saw from the cross and just how Jesus had identified with my sin in that moment. And then I went down to the tomb where there was this sense of warmth and renewal and joy and how Jesus had transformed all of that. In his own body, he manifested our sin, but then manifested our glory. And it just gave me like a greater understanding of the idea that he took our sin on himself but then raised it up again. There's a book on confession by Adrian von Speyer. 
And, um, and in that book, she has this meditation on confession. It's really interesting how she talks about it because she talks about like standing in line for confession, which is like when Jesus was waiting to be condemned. And then she talks about like going into confession and like confessing our sin. And she describes all of this as like the um, Jesus had taken our sin on himself as he was condemned. And then he went through like the scourging and everything else that led him to the crucifixion. And then he descends to the dead on Holy Saturday. And she has this imagery of he took our sin on himself. He descended into hell, sort of left our sin there and then ascended and resurrected. So going to confession is kind of like, there's this moment of confessing my sin and manifesting my sin is like when Jesus was crucified. And then there's sort of this period where I'm waiting for absolution, where everything's just kind of hanging out there. You know, if we think about, if we went to confession and it wasn't really routine, it's like the first time you went to confession and you're like, is the priest going to be nice? Is he actually going to forgive me? You know, and you confess your sin and you're sort of just waiting in this like vulnerable place. Like, uh, what's he going to do with all this information? (laughs) She describes that moment as like Jesus descending into hell and there's a separation of like our sin from him. And then speaking the words of absolution being like this resurrection where we enter into resurrected life because we've been restored as sons and daughters again. Those waters of baptism have been stirred up in our hearts again. And so the grace that we receive from our Lord, like it is that witness of the cross that enables us to entrust our life to our Lord again. And it's that grace that helps us to be pure of heart so that we can see God. Right? Not just in the next world, but that we can see God now. Because the pure see the body as making visible God's mystery. When we have purity of heart and we see another person, we see God in them. We see the image of God in them. That's what we're trying to teach our young people, that you are the image of God. And when you look at another person, you want to see the image of God in them. And we do that whether we're doing a chastity curriculum or our bullying curriculum. You know, that you want to see the image of God in that person. But to attain purity of heart and to see God, we have to contend with the system of forces within us. Or we have to contend with the fact that we have concupiscence, that we have a tendency to be lazy, or we have a tendency to not trust. We have a tendency to not believe we're good enough. We have a tendency to believe God loves everybody, but he doesn't love me. He only loves me insofar as I'm part of the collective. Right? That, by the way, is a result of Marx. Right? Marx's philosophy is about the collective. And so it does invade even our own thinking when we start to think about Jesus died for the collective, but not for each of us as individuals. And St. Paul describes that contending with the forces within us as this battle between the flesh and the spirit. Okay? And we have to remember that for St. Paul, he's not a Manichaean. He doesn't believe the flesh is bad and the spirit is good. A lot of times we interpret St. Paul as if he was a Manichaean, that all matter is evil. So we can take what he's saying and we can say, well, it's just my flesh, but my spirit is good. I'm only sinning with my body, but my spirit is intact. The flesh refers to the man of lust. The flesh refers to the world. When St. John talks about the world being like sin, Emmanuel Mounier says the flesh is like the movement of the entire person, body and soul, towards the worldly thing. While the spirit refers to the movement of the entire man, body and soul, towards God. So living in the spirit means we have to authentically move from, I said the red to the blue, and that refers to my marriage slide where it starts talking about using each other. 
Because right? purity is not halfway between promiscuity and prudishness. So purity is a virtue. And with every virtue, there's two opposing vices. So there's the virtue of... I'm trying to think of a virtue. Teachers, give me a virtue. Prudence. Give me a different virtue. <laughs> okay, so we use temperance. Okay, Temperance is the virtue by which... Right? I have the virtue of self-control okay? with regard to pleasure. So the excess of temperance, that virtue of self-control with regard to pleasure, ends up being this kind of like, I'm not going to have any pleasure at all in my life. Okay? It's like I have too much temperance in my life and I don't enjoy anything. The defect in temperance is I'm going to have all the pleasure I can possibly get. Okay, courage is a virtue by which we engage the arduous good. Okay, there's cowardice as a defect. And there's sort of, like, I can't think of the actual word that Aristotle uses for courage, excess. But it's kind of like this overboldness to the point of like, doing something that's not actually protecting anybody. So with purity, it's not halfway between promiscuity, which is, okay, I'm just going to go do whatever I want, and prudishness, which sort of cuts me off from everything. Purity is a lived relationship. It's kind of over and above both of these things. Because purity is when we see the other person as the image of God. And our sexual appetite is ordered towards manifesting the image of God. Eros is ordered towards the true, the good, and the beautiful in the other person. So it's not on this scale between I'm promiscuous or I'm prudish, but it's just living out the image of God as we should. So again, in teaching young people, we want to make sure that what we're teaching them is that purity is about this lived relationship with God. It's about being a son or a daughter of Christ. It's about a lived relationship with Christ. Okay? It's not about I need to control myself so I don't sin although that's part of it. And it's not about being afraid of the other person, right? So I talked about that, I think, on the first day when I talked about how we go to the girls and we say, guard yourself from the boys because they're so visual and they're going to use you. And then going to the boys and saying, you better guard those princesses because you're pigs. (laughs) It's about having a lived relationship with our Lord. Okay, because that does cause this breakdown. And it's related to something that we talked about earlier. And, um, and this is kind of advice for married couples. Um, because when we talk about sex and sexuality, the purity culture has led to this kind of idea that the pleasure part of sex isn't good. And it's in the way we catechize and we talk about things. You know, because, frankly, when a bunch of high school kids start asking me those questions, like, how far is too far? Which is a horrible formulation. I hate that question. So I usually use the Grand Canyon analogy, okay? <laughs> Which is, like, you go to the Grand Canyon and you have this big cliff. And so the cliff represents mortal sin. Okay, now I'm in mortal sin. So I don't want to be in mortal sin. So how far is too far? Well, if I'm at the Grand Canyon, they put a fence up right here. Right? The fence is here. It's not at the edge. Because I might fall over the fence, but I don't want to die if I fall over the fence. <laughs> so like the how far is too far question, it's like you got to put your fence here. Because how far is too far basically says how bad can I treat my girlfriend or boyfriend before I have to go to confession for it? That's a horrible question. How bad can I treat my girlfriend or boyfriend before I have to go to confession? You know, if we want to like really split hairs, like this is probably like you have an orgasm outside of the marital act, like, okay, you're there, you're over the edge, we know that. But in that formulation, what are we teaching people? Like, it's bad to have an orgasm. 
And then people grow up and they get married and they're like, it's bad to have an orgasm. And this actually is a problem for, um, for some couples because they have this fear of, I'm going to commit a sin. And it's like, I'm afraid I'm going to commit a sin. I'm afraid I'm going to commit a sin. I'm afraid I'm going to commit a sin for your whole life. And then you get married and it's like, okay. And it's hard for people like, to naturally like, make that transition. You can't transition from, I'm protecting myself from these horrible people to, okay, now I'm going to give myself to you completely. It becomes a difficult transition. So when we teach that posture of protecting myself, it actually can have a negative effect. And there's a lot of Christian authors who are writing about this. And, um, and it actually... It has come up a little bit as I've talked to some NFP teachers. Like it's a struggle that some people have, and um, and John Paul II writes about all of that in this book, Love and Responsibility. And so I recommend like married couples read this book if you have questions about those kind of things, because sometimes it's really difficult. And he's very clear when he talks about that unitive dimension of the marital act, and. So I'll read you this quote, and you'll be like, is that Catholic? It says, if a woman does not obtain natural gratification from the sexual act, there is a danger that her experience of it will be qualitatively inferior, will not involve her fully as a person. This sort of experience makes nervous reactions only too likely and may, for instance, cause secondary sexual frigidity. Yada, yada, yada. Right? Because he talks about how it's the duty of the husband, to make sure that he knows his wife's body enough that that unitive dimension exists for both of them. And it's important. Because sometimes we fall into this idea about sex and sexuality that's like Manichaean. And I remember being in chaplain school, army chaplain school, and we're with all different denominations. And, and the question came up, what does it mean that the two become one flesh? And my good friend who's a Baptist said, well, St. Paul says that it's better, to burn, it's better to be married than to burn. Okay, so basically, like, your wife's job is to make sure your desires are gratified and that's it. Yay, marriage. <laughs> then all these Catholic seminarians, you know, we're all, like, talking about the gift of self and being the image of the Trinity and all this stuff, you know. It was just really interesting. <laughs> But when we talk about using, um, this is a dynamism that happens, especially when, like, there is that dynamic where maybe, like, the wife doesn't enjoy sex. Because what happens is then the husband is sort of always put in a position where he's using her. And he feels like he's put in a position where he's using her. And after a while, he's just like, they kind of agree to mutual using. uh, Which isn't God's plan. And so, like, when that does come up, like, if you're ever privy to that, because sometimes it comes up in secret at Bible studies or something like that, like, there's psychologists and people that can help with those kind of issues. Uh, and it's, it is important. So, so it's not, like, more holy for a woman to have this attitude, like, well, my job is just to take care of my husband. That's it. I don't really care about myself. You know, that's not what we're called to. It's not what... John Paul II talks about in either of these books. Okay. I just wanted to throw that out there because it's kind of a, it's something that comes up. All right, so purity is not halfway, and this is just my normal deal. We have to move from like this red dynamic of sort of mutual using to a more purified love. And that movement happens by justification. Right? In, the comp- in the audience, as John Paul II says, that that movement from lust to love happens by justification. Justification is not only the remission of our sin, but it's also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. So when we say that we are justified in Christ, or we've received Christ, that we're now living in Christ, it means the interior renewal that happens in our hearts. It's a real power at work in us to free us from the bonds of sin and lust. 
so that grace enters into our life and it moves in us to free us from the bonds of sin and lust. And we experience purity of heart to the measure that we experience the freedom for which Christ has set us free. Right? As we experience more and more freedom from all forms of sin, we then have a greater freedom to give ourselves to each other in love. So for true freedom has to do with the freedom of the gift. So freedom to sin is sort of the flip side of freedom to love. If we seek to get rid of sin by getting rid of our freedom to commit it, then we also sacrifice our freedom to love. And there's an article called Truth and Freedom, and that's the article in which Pope Benedict talks about how we're created in the image of God, who is a being from, a being with, and a being for. And he uses the example of abortion and how the freedom to get an abortion is really asking for a freedom from that relationship that exists between the mother and the child. And it always removes somebody from the freedom that exists within a relationship. That true freedom actually exists when we find ourselves in a relationship of love. Freedom is negated when it becomes a pretext for indulgence. Right? It's not really freedom if then it becomes indulgence. Right? So I have the freedom to eat one scotcheroo. Not really. <laughs> right? Because that's how the virtue of temperance works. Like, and you've all done this, I think, like where there's a sheet cake or something like that. And you sort of walk into the kitchen and you see the sheet cake and your eyes aren't on our Lord, they're on the sheet cake. (laughs) And so you sort of look around and nobody's around. And so you pull out a fork and you just take like one bite of the sheet cake and you're like, I'm going to have one bite. (laughs) Okay, one bite of the sheet cake, I'm done. And then you go have some milk and you're like, man, that was really good. I'll take another one just a little bit. (laughs) And then you start to leave the room and you're like, somebody's going to know. And so you just like eat a line across the pan (laughs) so it's even, right? There's no freedom in that. You're like, freedom is I can have one bite of sheet cake. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for the sheet cake. And then I leave, right? So freedom is negated when when it becomes a pretext for indulgence, right? So we're not really free when we find ourselves in those situations. Okay, it's not freedom, it's slavery to our passions. Okay, it's not freedom, it's slavery to our passions. Okay, and this is, again, these are lessons that really need to be integrated in our school curriculum from kindergarten on up. Like, what is true freedom? And what's the difference between freedom and being in bondage to something else? You know, like, do you watch TV because you're free or do you watch TV because you cannot stop watching TV? You're just enslaved to the TV. You, know, you don't want to do what your mom and dad tell you, but you want to do what the TV tells you. Stay tuned for the next episode. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> so in the development of that freedom, like as we move from that man of slavery to that redeemed man, the virtues play an important role. Okay, the virtues are important because they teach us to control our bodies in holiness and honor. Right? And the development of virtue helps us to develop the habits of self-control. So the virtue of temperance helps us to turn away from temptation. The virtue of fortitude gives us the ability to endure and persevere in the virtue of temperance, oftentimes. Right? Forti- part of fortitude is long-suffering. So temperance says, I have self-control. I can say no to this pleasure right now. Fortitude is like, I can say no to this pleasure for the next 28 days, or however long it is. Right? 
couples who are practicing natural family planning who need to avoid for whatever reason, it takes temperance in the beginning and probably fortitude when it gets farther along. There's a couple of the husbands smiling right now. Okay. Right? It takes fortitude when that time of abstinence grows, okay, or when it naturally needs to be, like maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's a month. It's the virtue of fortitude that's needed there, not the virtue of temperance. Prudence is about making proper choices to avoid the occasions of sin, right? So prudence involves, especially in the area of purity, when we're talking about young people, it involves, like, what websites do you go to? When we're talking about parents, it involves, what am I going to allow my kids to have on their phone or on their iPad or on their iPod? Am I going to let them have access to the App Store? For a seven-year-old, probably imprudent. You know, because they're too young. They don't need that. Okay, for a married couple, it might be imprudent to have two different Facebook accounts. Okay, prudent thing would be to have a married Facebook account. Okay, because nobody's lonely ex high school girlfriend writes to Bob and Sue Smith. <laughs> so you marry your Facebook account. It's more prudent to be transparent. You know, today it's more prudent to be transparent with your online life. It's just more prudent. Okay, and so when I go around and I promote, like, use Covenant Eyes, protect your kids, don't wait too long. Like, I just wrote an article on the Covenant Eyes website. It got, like, 10,000 clicks. 10,000 people, like, went to the article because it got posted on Catholic Church Facebook page. And, uh, and the whole article is on, like, what to do after your kid sees porn. Um, and what, I, what do I promote? Like, trying to promote a culture where we use Covenant Eyes because it's prudent, we don't use covenant eyes because it's a punishment. I should make that a slogan. Prudent, not a punishment. Because <laughs> we use it just because it's prudent to be transparent about our online life. We don't use it because we're hunting for people who are bad people. Just use it because it's prudent. Because if anything did happen, we want other people to know about it. We don't want secrets in our life. We don't want shame to build in our lives. We want to bring everything into the open. Justice is about giving the other person their due. Okay, giving the other person their due. Frankly, within a marriage, the other person is due knowing everything that you do when you're online. Like, I think like that kind of online transparency, like every couple should have it. Why? Because they should know. Because you said, I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sick times and in health, till death do us part. I give my whole self to you. Not I give myself whole self to you, except for the three hours I'm on ESPN. You know, every husband has a right to know how much his wife is on Pinterest. <laughs> and vice versa. Last engaged encounter Dale and I were both on, it was this huge fantasy football showdown during the rap session. Like I had no idea fantasy football was such a, like an obstacle to intimacy and love. But <laughs> Um, yeah, it just had to do with fantasy football comes and there's no, there's no communication that happens. In the audience from October 24th, 1981, John Paul II says, we must be committed to a progressive education and self-control of the will, of the feelings, of the emotions. And this education must develop beginning with the most simple acts in which it is relatively easy to put the interior decision into practice. Okay, we have to be committed to progressive education and self-control of the will, the feelings, and the emotions. And that education is something we try to reinforce in our school system. We try to reinforce it in the home. We try to reinforce it in our homilies. And we start with the acts that are relatively easy to put the interior decision into practice. And this is where like, our Lenten promises come in. We do small things to develop that virtue in a small way. And as we develop that virtue in a small way, it helps to enter into the bigger way. So somebody who is able to say no to the sheet cake will also be able to say no to something else that's pleasurable that they need to avoid. And, and so developing those virtues is really important. And when you're teaching your kids the virtues, and like because you want to build that virtue of purity, and so you want them to avoid occasions of sin, you want them to have self-control with media, you can start to develop self-control with dessert. You can start to develop self-control when you know, they're younger 
with how much time you get to play on the iPad, with like whatever it might be that they like to start to develop that virtue and teach them like this is about being temperate and so we're going to exercise temperance by only doing five minutes, right? Every time you have like recess, it's an exercise in the virtue of temperance. Like we're going to take this much time, not more. You know, when you let your kids like go over in recess, you're actually not developing the virtue of temperance. You know, when they say five more minutes, you're not developing the virtue of temperance. When you hit the snooze in the morning, dun, 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 not developing the virtue of temperance. Because <laughs> there's a certain pleasure in that 10 more minutes that I sort of stay in this state of subconsciousness where I'm not really sleeping, but I'm not actually awake. And um, so in Opus Day, they practice the heroic minute, right? You know the heroic minute? It's like when you, it's the 60 seconds between your alarm going off and your feet hitting the floor. And so the heroic minute means I get up when my alarm says to get up and I'm up. And so we practice the virtue of temperance. And Christy's like, no! <laughs> so practicing that virtue of temperance there, it can help us to be more temperate throughout the day and have more self-control during the day. Um, and so all these virtues are important to like, help develop these things. But again, all these virtues have to be rooted in that first experience of God's love. And so we don't want to teach the virtues divorced from that experience of God's love. Because it's easy for the virtues to become, if I do all the virtues, then God will love me. Right? So we start with love, which moves to desire, which moves to an action. Because our Lord has entered into my life, I have a desire to be closer to him. And so I'm going to develop these virtues to eliminate all the distractions from my life. Right? It's a better narrative. You know, it's a truer narrative. St. Thomas says that the first thing is the presence of the beloved and the lover. It's like, I see a beautiful woman, makes an impression on my heart. I can't stop thinking about her. Creates a desire. And then when I just want to be around her all the time, and so it moves me towards her. Right? And then when there's this union, you experience joy. Okay? The same thing can happen like with, I don't know, a scotcheroo, I guess. Sometimes that happens <laughs> to me. I see a scotcheroo, it makes an impression on me. It calls to mind all the previous scotcheroos I've ever eaten, which creates a greater desire. And it moves me towards them. And then I eat it and I have joy. It's, it's kind of a mundane example, but it works. This is like the point in the class where everybody starts bringing scotcheroos in. Okay, authentic purity. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to tie up. Yeah, I'm going to tie up. I'll just do this slide and then we'll go... Um, we'll pick up here next week. So authentic purity. Um, John Paul II talks about the parts of the body that we think are less honorable, but he says they deserve greater honor. You know, because sometimes we think that the parts of our body that represent our sexuality are less honorable. They're the bad parts. They're the dirty parts. Something like that. Shame causes us to cover parts of our body. But those parts have greater honor because they reveal our call to image God in life-giving communion. So when we practice modesty, it's because we're preserving that gift which will allow us to enter into life-giving communion for the future. Right? It's not because they're bad. It's because we're preserving the gift for the future. Which makes it a more genuine, authentic gift. Okay, so these are all kind of notes for like things you put in your mind if you're a mom and you're teaching modesty as your kids are growing up or when it comes up in class with your students and you bring them along um, as they're growing up. Okay, so we're going to pick up here uh, next week and, um, and I'm just going to keep cruising through the audiences here and try to like synthesize with um, these kind of stories and things like that. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon all gathered here. We pray for the grace to love you with a pure heart. We ask you to transform in our own hearts whatever needs to be transformed. That we may live an authentic life as images of your loving communion. 
We pray continually for our young people that they may truly know their identity as your sons and daughters. And that in a world full of temptation, they may experience the freedom that only comes from fixing their eyes and their gaze on you, O Lord. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.